I grew up very much inner city in Chicago, kind of late 50s, very early 60s. But an immigrant family in a, in a neighborhood that had immigrants that was from southern Italy and from Eastern Europe. And um, making their way, you know, kind of, kind of coming from what Al Pacino called the lower mids, you know, the lower middle class, you know, that upper working class, lower middle class, kind of breaking into the American system, you know, as they could. So it's, it's less about a fascination than it is about an environment. You knew that the cigar store, you know, had a card room in the back. There's names in the newspapers. It's very, very much of a Chicago thing in, in the sense that front page was, came out of Chicago, came out of that sensibility. Uh, Mike Royko's column, you know, writing about this famous family of thieves who were kind of tragic comic, uh, the Pansco family, the three brothers and a sister, you know. I mean, so, so it, it became the, it's kind of the lore of the city, as it were. So in terms of knowing about it, it was in the air. It was just part of life on the streets. Michael and I had a mutual friend in Chicago whose name was Nate Grossman. He said that he had a friend of his who wanted to do law enforcement, police genre stuff. And here I'm a cop wanting to be a writer, and Nate thought, wow, I gotta put these two guys together. Chuck and I became very close friends, and Chuck was a detective in Chicago, in a kind of a in major crime unit. Every city has one major crime unit in LA, it's the robbery homicide division, and Chicago was a CIU. And then through Chuck particularly, started hearing his encounter with the real Neil McCauley. Neil McCauley was 49 years old, the day we met, and he had already served 25 years in the penitentiary. Of that 25, eight of it was on Alcatraz, and four years on Alcatraz in isolation, what they called the hole. The, the conversation took place almost 40 years ago now. Knowing his background as I did, I'm not gonna rehabilitate this man, okay? And I know that going in, so I said to Neil, why don't you go somewhere else and cause trouble? And he said, I like Chicago. <laughs> it, was, it was just real simple stuff. So I said to Neil, you realize that one day you're gonna be taking down a score and I'm gonna be there. Then he said, well, look at the other side of the coin. I might have to eliminate you. And I remember the very last thing I said to him was, I'm sure we'll meet again. You know, I just said to myself, I. I wonder where this is going to lead us. Chuck had cut into the crew, knew the crew was going to, was going to do uh, a burglary of a department store. And when Neil McCauley went in, there was one thing that was out of place. He had scoped out the score ahead of time, and he knew everything that was supposed to be there in terms of vehicles and parking lots and everything else. And Neil McCauley didn't know what was wrong, but he knew something was wrong. I had two detectives on the inside of the store. And when, once you get into a place like that, you can't move around. It's discipline like you've never known, believe me. And it was later that night, it was maybe five or six hours later, and we had men all around on the outside. And we get a call on the walkie-talkie that, that the crew's here. So this is going to go down, you know. And, of course, you're inside, and you know now that here comes this moment that you've dreaded for so long in, in so far that you realize that uh, maybe if things don't go absolutely right, you can get hurt or, God forbid, killed. They moved in to the downstairs area, which there was a little basement area in the back of this store, and they just sat there for maybe five or ten minutes listening to see if there's any movement. To this day, I'll never understand what it was that possessed the detective to get up and walk to the washroom because he couldn't stand sitting in this one position anymore and the, and the man he had to go and i had told these two guys you gotta go you go in your pants or you bring a cup but you don't get up and you don't move and when this guy got up and walked across the floor that's all neil had to hear goodbye they boogied and that was it that was the end of it. So now the really damaging thing is now he knew someone was on him. And prior to that, they didn't know anyone was on him. Well, that kind of self-discipline, that kind of real professionalism, 
Chuck admired, and he would he would say, "Look how great this guy! Look how cool this guy is to figure this out! Look how smart he is to have seen that and pull back and never go back." Even though Neil Neil Macaulay had invested thirty forty thousand dollars in setting up the score, he was walked away from the score and was never going to go back. Was never going to take it because it was a risk versus reward equ equation. And because one thing was out of place, the risk component just just skyrocketed. I think sometimes in the course of events, police officers can see a particular individual that they've been chasing, they've been working on, uh, perhaps as a, as a wily, clever opponent that in some ways mirrors their own self-image. If Chuck was a thief, what struck me was Chuck's sociopathic perspective about it. It's not sociopathic in Chuck's, but if Chuck had been a thief, it would have been sociopathic. What struck me about it was the duality. And, and that's not what one encounters in fiction. That Chuck had tremendous regard for this guy, had a lot of respect for him, was fascinated by him intellectually, thought the guy was terrific. If I didn't know who he was, and know as much about him as I did, then, you know, I would have probably thought that, you know, he's probably a halfway decent guy. In fiction, you would think, well, that means that there's a rapport that maybe they're going to, he'll cut him some slack. And that wasn't the case at all. Not even one iota of it. Not even a hesitation. Chuck would hesitate not one second dropping a hammer and killing a Macaulay, which he did subsequently in 1964. There's a supermarket at 47th and Cicero. It was a day that uh, they did their check cashing. So the armored car dropped off a lot of cash. We had tailed Neil Macaulay's crew endlessly. And then the next thing you knew, they drove into the parking lot and three of them came out of the car and went in. In the windows of this supermarket, they had all these advertisements. We could still see all the people that put their hands in the air and what have you. So we knew that it was going down at that time. And then we didn't try to go in. There were too many people inside. It would have been, God, it would have been awful. As they came out the door, they spotted my partner and I coming across the street with guns in our hands, and they opened fire at us. But then it was a foot chase, and we got them individually in between gangways of homes was where we finished them. And thus the end of Neil McCauley, a largely forgotten figure until Michael Mann resurrected him in this movie. I didn't mean to be rude. I didn't recognize you. I work in metals. I'm a salesman. My name's Neil. It was fortuitous that I met Chuck Adamson, who then introduced me to John Santucci and another.